How do we get from here to there, from Cana to Egypt? And not just geographically, but metaphorically as well. From a young spoiled brat to the trusted, perceptive counsel to Pharaoh of Egypt. Joseph's story brings us to the close of the book of Genesis. And in a certain way, it's perhaps the second and most important story in the book of Genesis behind that of Abraham. What I'd like to do in this video is look at some of the main trajectories in his story and why his story is so important. And quick look at his amazing Technicolor dream coat. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible, and my name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminaries for the past 20 to 30 years and make it available to anyone on YouTube. So if you like these videos, please give them a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel as well, that would really help me, and if you hit the little bell icon, YouTube will let you know when I post new material. Now, way back in the first video on Genesis, I mentioned how the narrative flow of the book of Genesis starts off really fast. From eternity past all the way up to Abraham in the first 11 chapters. And then chapters 12 through 25 slow down and focus on the life of one man, Abraham. 25 through 26 looked at the story of Isaac. With chapter 27, we shift to the story of Jacob. Now, starting in chapter 37, the text tells us that these are the generations of Jacob. And the Tadola there in 37 verse 2, which is used by the author of Genesis to mark these major shifts in the story. I have a list of all the places where that Tadola occurs. And it's translated as these are the generations of, or this is the account of, or this is the history of someone. The author of Genesis used this Hebrew word to inform you as a reader that we are entering a new section of the book. And with chapter 37, verse 2, we are now into the generation of Jacob, but in particular, it's going to focus on the life of Joseph. In 37, 2, it reads, These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilal and Zilpah his father's wife. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. Right from the very first two verses of Joseph's story, conflict is introduced. Joseph is younger than all of his brothers save one and he's working in the fields with them. And while he's working as a shepherd, he brings back a bad report to his father, Jacob. Now, we aren't sure whether this report was an actual report about what they were doing or if he is just slandering them. But that's not all. We're also told that Jacob loved Joseph more than his brothers. And to show this, the father had a special tunic or robe made from him. So we get an oral report, Joseph is slandering or bringing a bad report about his brothers. And then we have a visual representation that Jacob loved Joseph more and he gave him this special robe. Now we're not sure what this special robe or tunic was. And the idea that it was multicolored is based off the Greek translation of Genesis done around 200 BC. The Hebrew is not as clear as the Greek here. It's rather oblique. And the Hebrew word here, pas, could mean colored, it could mean embroidered, or having long sleeves. In an ancient commentary on the book of Genesis, Genesis Rabbah, the author tells us the word pas here in this text is a reference to the palm of the hand. So the tunic would have been one where the sleeves reached down to the palm of the hand. Now for someone working in the fields as a shepherd, this would not have been very practical. It would indicate then that Jacob did not intend for Joseph to be doing physical labor like his brothers, but rather to supervise them. Or it might indicate that this was a fancy tunic, one with patterns embroidered around the fringe of it. 
or it might be used for a fancy tunic that parents might have had made for their little children. But it's odd that we're told that Jacob is spoiling Joseph with this very, very special or pretty tunic. The main idea here that's being communicated is that Joseph is set apart from his brothers. And this tunic visually symbolized that Joseph held a special place within Jacob's heart and placed him above his brothers. And the brothers could see that Jacob favored Joseph every time they looked upon him. Now this is where context becomes really important. And remember in previous videos I've talked about sort of the exegetes cheer. Context, context, context. What does this author mean with these words in this particular text? Because remember that Abraham sent his first son Ishmael away after Isaac came along. Then Isaac loved Esau more than Jacob, but Rebekah favored Jacob more and helped him steal Esau's blessing. So now, three generations after this favoritism within the families, we have Jacob favoring Joseph. And I'm sure the other brothers knew this history as well. They would also know the history of this phenomenal promise that God had made to Abraham and that was passed down through Isaac and now rested on Jacob. So I'm sure the brothers were wondering, is Joseph, the youngest of our brothers, going to usurp our inheritance? Is he going to displace us? Are we going to be sent away? Is he going to inherit the blessings that God gave to Abraham rather than us? And given the family dynamics going on in the first few verses of Joseph's story, we know that trouble is brewing. So now that we've got Joseph's amazing Technicolor dream coat out of the way and discussed more interpretations for that possible coat than you probably cared to know, we now turn to the main sequence or the driving sequence in Joseph's story, that of his dreams. We have a total of six dreams in this story and they're grouped in pairs of two. So basically we have three dream sequences. So let's take a look at them in order. Dream sequence number one. In the first sequence, Joseph has two dreams, 37-7. Joseph tells his brothers his first dream. Hear the dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf rose up and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. His second dream takes this idea a little bit further. In 37.9, we're told that he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. Now, given the divisions within his family, and that Joseph is the youngest of his brothers, and he knows that they despise him, it seems rather odd that Joseph would tell his brothers these dreams, because basically he is pouring gasoline on a fire, and as a result, they hated him even more. And when he told the second dream to his father, even Jacob, his father who loved him, rebuked him. In both of these dreams, the brothers and Jacob clearly understand that the message of these dreams is that Joseph is going to be raised to a position above them in authority or power. For the brothers, this would have been right in line with their worst fears about this youngster. Joseph's telling his dream to his brother and his fathers betrays a lack of emotional intelligence or immaturity on his part as well. Surely he knew of their animosity toward him, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that this would not be warmly received by them. After this, the brothers were supposedly shepherding their flocks by Shechem. However, they moved on from Shechem to the region of Dothan. This is some 15 to 20 miles further from where Jacob was, and there's no indication that they sent word that they were doing this. When Jacob sends Joseph to check up on them, he has to find someone who knew where they had gone in order to find them himself. The physical distancing of the brothers from their father and Joseph is an indication of the strife within their family. But when the brothers see Joseph from afar, most likely because of his special little coat, they take counsel as to what they're going to do with him. Once Joseph catches up to them, then we have the whole story where they take him, they throw him in a pit, and they plan to kill him. But
But Reuben intervenes and tells them, let us not take his life. And then when they see a band of Midianite traders passing by, they sell their own brother as a slave to them. Joseph has now gone from the obnoxious little spoiled brother to a slave that's going to be sold on the market. The brothers then take Joseph's special tunic and dip it in goat's blood. And instead of taking it themselves back to Jacob, they send it by messenger and it says, we found this robe. Tell us whether this is your son's tunic or not. Now they knew it was him. And on the other hand, imagine how devastating this was for Jacob. His most precious child is now dead and they don't even have a body to mourn over or to bury. And they're going to live with this lie for the next 22 years. This family is now torn apart and in a certain sense they are dead to each other. The brothers must keep their silence all those years. Jacob mourns for his lost child and Joseph is a slave in Egypt. And it's not going to be until the very end of Joseph's story that he goes to visit his father. But I digress. Let's get back to the story of Joseph. In 3736, we pick up the story of Joseph. He has now been taken to Egypt and the Midianite traders have sold him in the Egyptian slave market to Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's guard. But before we move on a little bit further, we need to back up and introduce a little bit more context to this story as well. If we back up to chapter 35 of the book of Genesis, when God blessed Abraham, he included a dire warning in the middle of this blessing. He tells Abraham, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and they will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. In order for God's promises to Abraham to be fulfilled, his family has to go to another land and suffer there for 400 years as slaves. Joseph's dreams about his family set in motion his brothers selling him as a slave, which brings him to Egypt. And he will be the catalyst that will bring all of his other brothers there in the closing chapters of the book of Genesis. While Joseph is not the son on whom God's promises specifically rest, instead, Jacob is going to divide that up pretty evenly between all of them. But Joseph is the reason and the driving force why Israel ends up in Egypt. Back to our story. While serving as a slave in Potiphar's house, Joseph was successful in all his work. Potiphar recognizes this and appoints him as overseer over his household. And Joseph continued to have success in that role as well. We're not sure how many years have passed, but this young shepherd has been sold as a slave and now has learned not only how to be loyal and serve his master, but he does it exceptionally well for a time. Then comes the famous encounter with Potiphar's wife. When Joseph refuses her persistent request to lie with me, she then turns the household against Joseph. And then to Potiphar directly, she says, the Hebrew servant who you brought among us came in to laugh at me. Now this idea of laughing at is a euphemism for sexual abuse or rape, to degrade her by taking sexual advantage of her. Now Potiphar could have had Joseph killed, but I think out of respect that he has for him and perhaps not trusting his wife, he has him thrown into prison instead. And the prison that he has him placed in is the one where Pharaoh places those who were in service to him as well. It's sort of the royal prison. If Joseph thought that being a slave in Potiphar's house was where God was leading him, he was wrong. It's only a halfway house and he has to learn how to serve someone else and how to manage a large household while he's there. But now he needs to move on to his second school. In order to end up in Pharaoh's service, he needs to go to prison where he's going to come into contact with those who know Pharaoh and have served him in the past. The first dream sequence ends up in alienating Joseph further from his family. He ends up thrown into a cistern and then sold to Midianite traders and then bought as a slave by Potiphar, only to be thrown into prison. 
This brings us to dream sequence number two, chapter 40. Now, while in prison, Joseph meets Pharaoh's former baker and cupbearer, who each have their own dream. And their dreams really trouble them. They are downcast because there is no one to interpret them. In Genesis 40, verse 9, the chief cupbearer tells his dream to Joseph. And he says to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches, and as soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Joseph then interprets this dream as, In three days Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. The positive interpretation of this dream then leads the baker to share his dream with Joseph as well in verses 16 through 17. I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating out of the basket on my head. This time Joseph heaps bad news upon this poor man. In three days Pharaoh will lift up your head, from you and hang you on a tree and the birds will eat the flesh from you. Joseph could have interpreted this dream the same way as the cupbearer's dream. Birds were seen as semi-divine representations in the ancient world, especially in Egypt. The god Horus in Egypt was often depicted as having the head of a bird. So why doesn't Joseph interpret this dream as good news like the previous dream? We're not told why. But the fulfillment of the interpretation of these two dreams confirms his ability to discern between the two. And just so that you don't miss that these two dreams are paired together, Joseph opens the interpretation of both dreams with the word, In three days Pharaoh will lift up your head. The cupbearer will be lifted up out of prison and back to his former position. The baker's head will be lifted up, literally, from his body. This brings us to the third pair of dreams. In chapter 41, Pharaoh has two dreams that are paired together. In the first dream, seven healthy cows come up out of the Nile River. Then seven thin emaciated cows come up out of the river and they eat the seven healthy cows. In the second dream, we have seven plump ears of grain that are growing on a stalk. Then seven thin, blighted ears sprout up behind them, and they swallow the plump ears. Now these are rather horrific dreams. If you just had the first part of each one, it would be okay. And like the cupbearer or the baker, Pharaoh is now troubled by his dreams. However, none of his magicians or wise men could offer an interpretation for his dreams. It's at this point that the cupbearer all of a sudden has a V8 moment. Wow! And he tells Pharaoh, when I was in prison, the baker and I both had dreams one night. And this young Hebrew was there and he was able to interpret both of our dreams. And he interpreted them just as it played out. Because of Joseph's contact with the cupbearer in prison, Pharaoh then knows who he is and sends for Joseph to come interpret his dreams. Joseph's dreams were similar but differed in magnitude. The baker and the cupbearer's dreams were interpreted 180 degrees from each other. So how are Pharaoh's two dreams to be interpreted? Are they similar, differ in magnitude, or what? With Pharaoh's two dreams, Joseph starts his interpretation by saying, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. The second thing that we need to note here is that Joseph doesn't take credit for his interpretation, but he gives credit to God. God has revealed it to Pharaoh. Instead of playing himself up here, he gives credit to God who has revealed it and to Pharaoh to whom it has been revealed. This is very different from when Joseph told his dreams to his family. Joseph is much more circumspect now. At the very end of his interpretation, he is then going to advise Pharaoh. Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. It's at this point that the narrator slides from Joseph interpreting to advising, Pharaoh should do this, verse 34. 
Joseph advises Pharaoh that because there's going to be seven years of abundance in Egypt, followed by seven years of famine, that Pharaoh needs to set aside and collect stores of food so that the people will be able to survive the seven years that are coming. Now, just as a side note, I brought this up before, but in the story of Noah and the Flood, we have one of climatic destruction. Here, we have another one. There are going to be seven years where the climate is going to change and the people are going to perish. So when we start seeing reports and warnings about climate change, this is not something that is not biblical and is not something that is anti-Christian or anti-theological. We have really strong basis for this within the biblical text itself that we should take these warnings seriously. But I digress. Let's get back to our story here. After listening to Joseph's interpretation and his advice, Pharaoh replies in verse 38, Can we find a man like this in whom the Spirit of God rests? Pharaoh then takes and makes Joseph second in the land only to him and places a ring on his hand, the robe on him, and a gold chain around his neck. And one can't help but notice that this robe echoes back to this tunic that Jacob had placed upon his son. Joseph has now been elevated and his dreams about being the sheaf that rises up or the sun, moon, and stars all bowing down to worship him are going to take place. You can read the rest of the story on your own, how Joseph prepared Egypt for the famine and then managed the stores of food in Egypt. But this is also part of Abraham's blessing. Remember, context, context, context. When God blessed Abraham in chapter 12 and verse 15, part of that blessing is that your family would be a blessing to many nations. Now, Joseph is fulfilling that. He is a blessing to the people in Egypt. It's also the reason why Jacob's family is going to have to migrate to Egypt because of the famine, and Joseph will test them and then reveal himself to them later on in the story. So how did we get here from there? As God revealed in Abraham's story, Israel is now in a foreign land and will soon be in bondage as well. Joseph has gone from the spoiled brat of Jacob. He was sold as a slave, imprisoned under false pretense, and now is the wise, perceptive advisor to Pharaoh. Joseph's story is also an important reminder that it's not about you. It's about God. Imagine how differently this story would have been if God's plan for us was to have a good, satisfying, rewarding life. Rather, God fulfilled his plans and his promises by having Joseph, almost killed by his brothers, thrown into a dried up well, being sold as a slave to Midianites, finding himself as a slave in the household of Potiphar, being tested sexually, thrown into a prison on trumped up charges, and finally being elevated to the second highest position in all of Egypt. God took Joseph down a very rocky road and it made all the difference. I hope you've enjoyed this series on the top 10 stories in Genesis according to me. I think there were actually 11 and this is probably the reason why I'm a theologian and not a mathematician. I'm going to take next week off because I need to prepare my final video. I want to do one on the stories of women within Genesis. Remember, please subscribe. That helps these videos become more important. Give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below if you have a question or idea. And finally, if you hit that little bell icon, YouTube will let you know when I post a new video. Until next week, may the peace of God be with you.